Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trenches Technology webinar series. I'm Sharon Bueno, Managing Editor of Trenches Technology Magazine, and it's my pleasure to introduce our presentation, Engineers Turn to Injection Grouting to Stop Sewer Infiltration, sponsored by the National Association of Sewer Service Companies, commonly known as NASCO, and the Infiltration Control Grouting Association, ICGA. We're going to launch a quick poll while I address some housekeeping, housekeeping items, so please select your response to the question you see on your screen, and then click the blue Return to Presentation button. To optimize your viewing experience, please close any programs that may be running in the background. You can also maximize your, view, your viewing window by clicking the box with the X at the upper right corner of the slide. Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. We encourage you to participate by typing your question into the Ask a Question panel in the left-hand portion of your screen throughout the webinar. We will tweet about highlights of the presentation throughout our Twitter feed. Feel free to join the discussion by sharing your experiences by including at Trenchless Tech in your tweets. Our first speaker is Ted Deboda, who is the Executive Director of NASCO. Ted has 30 years of engineering experience in the municipal and private sectors. He is a certified master trainer under the NASCO Pipeline Assessment Certification Program and has served on numerous committees and currently serves as a delegate for WEF. Prior to NASCO, he was the Baltimore Office Manager for URS Corporation and Chief of Project Management for Newcastle County, Delaware. He received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Delaware and is a registered professional engineer in Maryland and Delaware. And with that, I will turn it over to Ted. Thanks, Sharon. Hello and welcome to the Trenches Technologies webcast titled Engineers Turn to Injection Grouting to Stop Sewer Infiltration. This webinar is being sponsored by NASCO and ICGA. Now, I'll take a few minutes to introduce these organizations. NASCO is the National Association of Sewer Service Companies. Uh, and again, I'm Ted DeBoto, Executive Director. Our mission for almost 40 years has been to set industry sta standards uh, for the assessment and rehabilitation uh, <clears throat> of underground infrastructure and to assure the continued acceptance and growth of Trump's technologies. We're also proud to have ICGA as one of our divisions uh, and of the work that they do to support this industry. So who is the ICGA? The ICGA is the Infiltration Control Grouting Association, a division of NASCO. Their mission is to support and promote the proper use of chemical grouting as a safe, economical, and effective means to reduce groundwater infiltration into sewer collection systems. Since you're all on this webcast, you can see how ICGA's goals support NASCO's goals. So today's webinar, we'll examine the origin of infiltration by looking at sewer and storm pipe trench systems, injection grouts and municipal grouting, remote test and seal delivery systems, and the engineer's instructions uh, from an engineering perspective. We'll follow that with a, a Q&A session. And as Sharon mentioned, you'll have the ability to send your questions to the presenters during this presentation. Now, we'll be monitoring your questions, and we'll have time at the end to present some of them to the panel. We also plan to provide an FAQ, a Frequently Asked Questions posting for injection grouting that will be available on both the NASCO and the ICGA websites. So today's speakers uh, today uh, will be John Nelson from Vigisewer, Don Rigby from Avanti International, Mark Ankel from Logiball, and Jim Shelton from Arcadis. And we'll start with John. Our first speaker is John Nelson. John has over 25 years' experience in the trenchless industry. He attended The Ohio State University and is experienced in system inspection, maintenance, and rehabilitation techniques. Currently, John's vice president at Vigia Sewer Incorporated, where he's responsible for field operations throughout the Midwest region. He's active in various regional and national trade associations. He is a past past president of NASCO, and he lives in Racine, Wisconsin. John. Thank you, Ted. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to discuss the sanitary sewer and storm sewer trench systems, how they interconnect, and how the construction of the pipe and trench systems plays a vital role in the uh, infiltration and deterioration of our sewage collection systems. This illustration clearly shows how our underground water, storm, and sanitary sewer systems were laid. 
one upon the other with many overlapping and interconnecting trenches. Our original piping systems were installed with the primary purpose to convey water sewage away from our homes and businesses. However, little attention was made to the concept of sealing the pipe joints. We put a bunch of pipe in the ground, over 5 billion feet in the last 125 years, a larger majority of which was clay pipe with short 2-foot and 3-foot pipe segments. These were joined by simple sealing methods, primarily mortar or tar joints. And as I mentioned, seal integrity was not a factor. It was sewage. It could leak into the ground, no different than the outhouses we were eliminating at the time. Here's a drawing of a clay pipe with a poured tar joint. They were common, and you can see the seal was many times incomplete, leaving gaps, air pockets, and cold joints as the tar randomly flowed into the joint area. Air testing was not typically done, thus these type of sealing techniques were considered insufficient or considered sufficient and were simply accepted. Along with all the clay sanitary sewer pipe that was being installed, a large amount of concrete storm sewer pipe was also going in the ground. The storm sewer joint received even less attention as most pipes were simply pushed together and backfilled with any type without any type of joint seal at all. The pipe segments were all well aligned at installation because we used graded aggregate bedding materials. But bedding material porosity had created a French train effect in the sanitary and storm sewer trenches, which is a major contributor to our infiltration problems today. Here you can see the selected and graded bedding aggregate and the tar joints. Even in clay and loam soils, the pipe bedding is providing a French drain channeling future infiltration water to any leaking joint or connection. Note the pipe is partially bedded into the gravel rock. This tends to explain why infiltration at the bottom of the pipe, the 6 o'clock position, is so common in pipe joints. Here is a cross-section cutaway showing the sanitary and storm sewer pipe trenches. You can see how these pipes and trench systems are interconnected. The center section highlighted in blue shows the storm sewer trench water. Its behavior in this trench is what's causing many of the issues we are encountering in today's systems. This diagram actually better depicts what is occurring. As the water in the storm sewer trench starts to rise, it moves in a French drain effect to the outside of the pipe until it reaches the sanitary sewer crossing trench and then bang, this water is now moving within the sanitary sewer trench. Here's a look at a typical street. The large round pipe in the center is the storm sewer main. It is located above the sanitary sewer main. The cross-section pipes going to the left and right are the connections to the catch basins and house laterals, respectively. It is important to remember that most of the storm sewer system did not have any joint seals. Thus, the vast majority were simply pushed together. Here are we seeing some groundwater depicted it is depicted in green as we start to saturate the pipe trench. In many cases, the existing groundwater is below the sanitary sewer pipe. When you add sewage to the pipe, depicted here in brown, to areas with low groundwater, you commonly have exfiltration occurring as a result of old and sufficient joint materials. Here is a depiction of the start of a rain event. In the early stages, inflow starts to occur, and as the pipe starts to fill, the head pressure in the sewer pipe begins to grow. Once the pipes are full, as depicted in blue in this diagram, inflow continues to develop head pressure on the piping systems, which in turn causes exfiltration through the open joints in the main line and pipe and lateral pipes. You may even see it with occurring within the manholes, which are surcharged during rain events. At times, the water pressure is higher within the pipes, and you get exfiltration. And sometimes the trench water is actually greater outside the pipe, and you get infiltration. 
This ebb and flow is the key component in our deteriorating clay pipe infrastructure. It's almost like a breathing effect. With each rain event, the system surcharges and exfiltration occurs. When the rain subsides, the surcharge sanitary sewer pipe is relieved and we start to see infiltration. Along with this infiltration come the soil fines which are being washed back into the pipe throughout the open joints. During this breathing effect, water is moving back and forth between the pipe and the trench with each sub subsequent rain event. This process begins to break down the bedding soil and it emulsifies the fines and these materials begin to moving within the pipe. These fines are many times the sediment we find in the sewer pipe when we're cleaning or inspecting the sewer. The loss of these bedding soil fines starts to destabilize the bedding material and the pipes begin to move. And if you get pipes moving, you're going to start to lose alignment. Over time, this is what we now have. The fines in the bedding are gone, pipe is moving, the joints are breaking open, and the pipe is cracking. This phenomenon has been occurring since the pipes were installed. It did not just start occurring when we started looking at these systems. And it continues. If unstopped, we end up with these type of conditions, sinkholes under roadways and foundations leading to full structural failures. The key is to catch it here, prior to severe deterioration. In closing, the water within a trench is the key to controlling I&I. &I. Now that you have a clear understanding of why the problems are occurring, we can start to discuss how to prevent and reverse these trends. The next presenters are going to address a solution to these issues. But first, we'd like you to each participate in a poll question. Um, the question will be launched here in just a second. And we'd like each of you to participate in that question. The question is, what is your current perception, belief on municipal grouting? A, low confidence. B, temporary repair tactic. C, appropriate with other trenchless technologies. D, long-term standalone solution. Or E, anxious to learn more. Please select one of those sections, one of those questions. I mean, one of those answers, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll show the answers to this poll in just a minute. As we're waiting for uh, the responses, please remember to type any other questions you may have for the presenters. And we're going to actually have a brief Q&A session at the end of the next speaker. So if you have any questions for myself or Don Rigby, who will be the next speaker, please go ahead and type those in as, we, as we're presenting. And we'll tackle those at the end of the next session. And then we'll have a final Q&A session at the end of the webinar. That I'll go ahead and post the poll results. And I uh, thank you for your participation in that, uh, in that poll. And I think we'll go ahead and have Don get started. Uh, let me introduce Don. Don Rigby is the Vice President of Marketing and Education for Avani International. Don is responsible for both strategy and execution of marketing and educational programs. With a formal education at Ohio State University and decades of civil and business leadership, the foundation for Don's passion comes from personal experience as president of his own enterprise, which he sold in, nine, in 2009. Thank you, John Nelson. Uh, the backside on collection systems we all inherited is appreciated, and I'd like to begin with a little backside on the grouting industry. Uh, chemical grouting was initiated initially to stabilize soils in the 1950s, and it was in the 60s when uh, it was adopted for municipal applications. I've had the pleasure of interviewing a few of these early pioneers, and we call them grout and grace because they were truly inventors and caused many of the technology advancements in CCTV and pumps and packers and, and the grout chemistry. In the, uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, 
Uh, it's a decades of time that I refer to as the wild, wild west. There were no standards. And it was largely contractor-driven and inconsistent success stories. And from this era form many of the opinions and beliefs about crowding. And some of those still exist today, including fear, uncertainty, and doubt about, about, the, uh, about the solution. In uh, the last 10 years, performance standards from ASTM were released for mainline, laterals, and manholes. In 2012, NASCO ICGA released their standard for uh, operating standard for more predictable results. In the name of education, the industry players collaborate together very well to really teach these standards and preach the value of these standards and make common practice. Uh, we do this within four to five grout schools throughout North America every year. Uh, in a word, quality defines the current decade. And the grouting community is much more unified today than ever, focusing on scientific achievements and proof of performance and granting the consulting community, the engineering community, tools to add value to projects. And by value, I mean, I mean specifying process, procedures, and products based on conditional assessment with an eye on longevity and controlling cost and maximizing return on investment, which includes on-site inspection to ensure that spec is adhered to uh, precisely. And later on in this presentation, you'll hear from Jim Shelton, who is a current day pioneer in this notion of value engineering on grouting projects. So let's talk briefly about grout chemistry and the fundamentals of injection grouting. So what is injection grouting? It's a liquid resin that turns into an impermeable solid in a predictable time frame used to stop leaks in above grade structures, stop infiltration in below grade structures, stabilize soils, control groundwater, and seal that annular space between host pipe and lining. Um, a geotechnical uh, contractor in Canada once referred to this term of wonder grout, and it stuck with me. So I thought I'd use the terms to make a sticking point with you. There is no such thing as wonder grout. There are dozens of formulations, and each are engineered to perform different tasks. And the additives change outcomes. This is technology you control, technology you can specify, and what you know absolutely matters. There are three grout uh, primary grout families, acrylic grouts, polyurethane grouts, and cementitious grouts. Cementitious grouts have a structural quality to it and most often used in geotechnical applications, such as mining and tunneling and uh, dams and, and uh, subway systems. Polyurethanes are either hydrophobic or hydrophilic, and they cure rigid or flexible, and acrylics are most often used for sealing main lines, and laterals, and for good reasons. Acrylics, specifically acrylamide, have the same viscosity as water. It goes anywhere water goes. And there are no suspended solids, so it's clear. And we use tracer dyes to be able to uh, track both the A side and the B side of our two component system so that we are what we view, the blend between green and yellow dyes is green, and, and uh, green is good. Uh, field adjustable um, cure times, anywhere from five seconds to 10 hours, and that's based on the depth of permeation you want to accomplish in the soils. Um, certainly field adjustable gel strengths, soap and water cleanup, uh, not activated by moisture, much like uh, the polyurethanes are for the most part. So there's no need for solvents, and we have a successful track record by and large. So here are some additives that really do change outcomes, and these are value-added engineering elements that will find its way into specifications. Roots are relentless. 
They will find its way to nutrients. And the sewer trench is a target-rich environment. So our recommended uh, root inhibitor really does not do anything to destroy the vegetation, but just to discourage root growth in and around that sewer trench or in the joints where it gains access to the, uh, um, um, the sanitary sewer system. It, this additive is good for about three years, and in that time frame, that roots have found other sources of nutrients, so it's a discouragement. Um, when it comes to potassium ferrocyanide, this is the right way to extend gel times. You can do it by water temperature, but the more scientific way to do it is by the use of KFE. Ethylene glycol is intended initially and primarily for lowering freezing temperature, but it also has a hydrating quality uh, to the grout mix. Latex is a product I, I admire and dearly <laughs> appreciate because besides the, the gel strength, it adds a degree of flexibility to that product. Diatomaceous earth has similar qualities to it, and I've already mentioned tracer dyes and why they're used and, and why they're important and why they should be specified in that engineer's specification. Let's go back and talk about enemy number one. Infiltration is, in fact, the root cause of the demise of our collection systems. 50% of the flow to the wastewater treatment plant is clean groundwater. This increases the cost for treatment. It shortens the lifespan of our uh, assets, reduces capacity. Clearly, infiltration is enemy number one. I wake up every day grateful for these technology alternatives. All these are important. They all have one thing in common. These are structural repairs. Injection grouting is non-structural, and it's engineered specifically to stop infiltration at all four points of entry. And these are the four points. Manholes, mainline joints, service line connections, and the first few feet or the first few joints of the service line connection. If you understand this slide, you gain the keys to the kingdom because this helps to explain why proactive maintenance beats reactive repair every time. At stage one, it could occur within the first year the pipe goes in the ground. Stage two indicates a severe loss of supporting soils in the sanitary trench. And stage three, we are at a point of failure. Now, you can grout at stage one and stage two. You can certainly line at stage two and maybe at stage three. Stage three could be at a point where you couldn't even line. Um, so there is a solid reason for thinking proactively about identifying the stage of sewer failure that your systems are at and take the right proactive step prior to needing structural repair. And to do and to really target and and defeat infiltration, it takes a holistic approach. By holistic, I'm talking about all four points of entry, main lines, laterals, lateral connections, and manholes. Now, to isolate one source of entry is, is limiting. The goal is to seal the entire system. And if you focus on one, there's a, there's a better than average chance that groundwater level will rise and will find another point of entry. When I'm talking about grouting uh, of main lines, for instance, the real value is not in the joint itself. This is a soil sealing process, and the real value is in the outer connection with the soils on the outside of the pipe to create a positive seal. In this slide, I'm demonstrating a, a lined main line. Um, CIPP lining does not stop infiltration. It does a great job of reallocating that uh, to another point of entry. Reinstating uh, the lateral uh, 
ushers in water from the uh, annular space between the host pipe and liner. Grouting laterals does stop infiltration, and it does stop that, uh, seal that annular space between the liner and host pipe. Manholes, I often refer to as the low-hanging fruit because it has such easy access. But the shrink coefficient of the different materials in a manhole structure make it extremely vulnerable to defects, such as cracks and pipe insertions, and faulty seals, and step inserts, and lifting holes. We're familiar with the two types of manhole structures that exist, brick and mortar, precast concrete. And there are, uh, there are techniques for sealing each of these manholes and for different reasons. Uh, vertical crack injection uh, is something more common in a, um, a precast concrete horizontal joint in, uh, injection. Obviously, for precast concrete, oakum socum is used for either brick or concrete. But curtain grouting is often uh, used, and it's used with an acrylic more often than not because you encompass the entire um, entire structure and create a seal around the entire structure allowing no water to enter because when it comes to brick and mortar um, you're it's difficult to chase that water from different points of entry and sealing it completely on the outside is the right way to go probe grouting is another technique and all of these techniques are animated and available for viewing at avantigrout.com this quote from ASC is relevant. The common practice of letting infrastructure wear out before replacing it, rather than incorporating technological improvements during its lifetime, only exasperates the problem. And the point is clear. Proactive maintenance beats reactive repair every time. Whether it's a municipality self-performing or if it's an engineer construction project, grouting, is an answer, and grout first is an option I'm going to talk about here in a minute. But let's talk logic for a second. Let's talk about the business case of any proactive uh, uh, remediation. And these are just simple investment guidelines. These dollars mean nothing in terms of per foot or lineal foot cost. Just think in terms of this framework. You can spend a dollar for injection grouting. You spend 4 to $5 for CIPP lining. Or you can spend $10 plus, plus, plus for a pure replacement. What that really means is that injection grouting is about 25% of the cost of lining. And that's for main lines. Injection grouting is about 10% of the cost of lining laterals. So there's a compelling business reason because every municipality I'm familiar with never has enough money to do everything they want to do. Grouting allows you to affect more of the system for a longer period of time, and this is a valid business case for recognizing grouting. So consider grout first. You need to certainly do grouting and stop the infiltration before you do any lining, so grouting is complementary to all transfer technologies. It's a low-cost, high-reward strategy, uh, we have now have recognized performance standards with ASTM, um, and that's for manholes, laterals, and for main lines. And we have standard operating guidelines from NASCO. And the adoption of these has been terrific. Injection grouting can be, should be, your first defense against infiltration in manholes, laterals, and main lines. And with that, I'll turn the uh, presentation back over to John. Very nice, Don. Appreciate that. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I apologize to everyone. I forgot to to post the survey results of the poll question that was uh, that was launched during the last uh, the last break. So we'll go ahead and post those at this time. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and get on with the next speaker. But we've got a few extra minutes. We've got a couple questions that came in from the audience. I'd like to do a little Q&A session right now. And uh, if Don needs to stay on the line, we'll go ahead and tackle a couple of these questions from the audience. 
First one, uh, I'd like to head your way. It says, uh, when grouting between the host pipe and the liner at the service connection, would an additive such as latex or diatomaceous earth be used to strengthen the grout and help keep the grout in place? Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of latex. Uh, it adds an elasticity quality to, to the mix. And elasticity is really important, and the hydration quality comes from that is really important as we get higher up towards the surface and uh, in a shallower surface where there could be more drying of the environment. Look, there's usually enough moisture in the soil, much, enough humidity in the soil to keep grout happy. I think that latex adds another element of assurance of allowing grout to perform as you get closer to the surface. Um, so I'm a, I'm a fan of latex with lateral. Very good. Appreciate that. Thank you. And then another question that we had uh, was more specific uh, regarding uh, when joint sealing of clay and RCP changed over time. What time period was it common practice to use tar to seal clay pipe joints, and when did the modern practice of using rubber joints start? Uh, my recollection to that is that the, the using tar and uh, mortar was being used back in as, as early as the 19. 19- 10, 1915, somewhere in that range. Uh, the idea of using rubber for those joints in, in clay pipe uh, certainly didn't get started until the, the 60s, uh, almost about the same time we started seeing some PVC in the marketplace. Uh, there's a really good uh, website, uh, sewerhistory.org. If you're looking for historical information, you can reference that site. It can give you some great information about the history of sewer systems throughout the world. And uh, and speaking of the world, just for everyone's information, we've got over 23 countries online with us today. So we appreciate those that are joining us from uh, from abroad as we are currently located here in the United States. With that, I think we'll go ahead and get started with with Mark Engel's presentation. Uh, Mark Engel is president of Logiball, where he's responsible for the design and fabrication of test and seal packers. Mark has played a key role in the development of ASTM standard practices for chemical grouts and for infiltration control in sewers. He has participated actively in NASCO as a committee chair, board member, and past president, and is the founding member, or is a founding member, of ICGA. Mark, take it away. Thanks, John. Um, In order to get the uh, grout out into the soil, there needs to be some equipment involved. Uh, remotely accessing joints in smaller pipes and laterals can't be done by humans, so we have to use equipment and operate it from the surface. Uh, basically, what you're seeing is the mobile unit, the CCTV ground truck, uh, manholes at both extremities, remote winch, and everything is typically being towed the line and positioned with the help of the CCTV cameras. Um, Mobile units uh, could be trucks, as you see here. Uh, they, are, they have the generators, the compressors, the vacuum pumps, the hoses, the tanks, and all the controls basically in the rooms that the operator knows what is going on beyond his site. Um, typically, the compressors supply air to the packers. Uh, they can supply air to the pumping system if we have air pumps. Uh, there could also be electric pumps being used. Uh, the monitoring system of the void, uh, you see on the top picture, on the right-hand picture, all the knobs and controls and valves that are used to control during the operation. Uh, the picture below basically now shows that it is out on the market where a software or computer, uh, with the help of the operator, can control this basically with the click of a mouse. Um, an important thing, whether it be any system, is basically to monitor what is going on beyond the operator's site. When that packer is inflated, no one knows exactly what's going on in between those two inflated bladders. Unless you have a transducer or a gauge that is connected to that void tell you what is going on, whether it be for the air test pressure or during the test and seal operation when grout is being pumped in that void out into the soil. So the measuring, basically, uh, as per ASTM or NASCO specs, the integrity of that pressure monitoring system is a must. Um, I put those pictures here. A lot of people wonder how grout gets out. Uh, There's no static mixers. It's two independent hoses. 
and basically the grout mixes upon the exit of the packer. Uh, the grout basically fills up the void. When I say void here, I'm talking in between the two seals of the rubber up against the pipe prior to exiting that pipe and the materials going out to saturate the surrounding soil. Before all this is done, there needs to be a few uh, housekeeping things done. Uh, first thing, measure and confirm the diameter of the pipe. Many times you can go in a pipe, you're looking down from the, in, from the manhole top. Uh, there's got to be an 8-inch pipe. You get there, it's a 9-inch pipe. Well, make sure. Cleaning the mainline sewers, this has to be adequate. You have rubber that seats against the inside surface of the pipe. You still have sand in there or roots or other debris, and you can't get the rubber to seat. You will not get the air test to pass or the grout to, to go through the joint. It might go through the bladders. Videotape CCTV inspections of the mainline sewer. Know the enemy before you start your battle. Protruding taps, obstructions, anything that can't allow the equipment to go through has to be removed. Well, the same thing with roots and grease. Well, basically everything is being winched in tandem to the joint. Uh, the pack would then be inflated over the joint. You can see that there's a hollow core on the mainline packer, so it does allow some of the flow to go through. But you do need to know where you are going to set up on the joint. So if there's too much water in the line, you might have to resume to some kind of flow control. The joint is there. There is then air tested to the specifications. If the joint passes the air test, then the packer would be deflated and moved on to the next joint where that would be repeated. If it fails the air test, it remains in position, and this procedure for grouting starts. So the grout is pumped, fills up the void between the packer and the pipe, goes out through the existing defects. Okay? The scarcity of these materials will allow it to go through small cracks. The operator monitors the void sealing pressures during the process. Now, depending on the volumes pumped, the operator may go to a stage or a step grouting process. Um, I'll explain this in the next few slides. So after that sealing procedure, the air joint would be air tested a second time. If the air test passes, then the packers move to the next joint. If not, the grouting process continues. So the stage grouting or step grouting is basically trying to build layers of grout until a seal is achieved. So if you're pumping three, four, five gallons of grout on an eight inch joint and the pressure's not raising and you can't get it to seal, you basically let that set, and before the gel time, which we already know, is to start pumping again to build layers of grout until we achieve that seal. Here's an example of what's basically seen on the, uh, in the truck. The packer being inflated. It is now inflated in the middle. Chemical grout is being pumped through the packer. Grout is building pressure. You can see 6.1 PSI. So basically the equivalent of just over 13 feet ahead. And when the packer deflates afterwards, that transducer reading that end up on the screen is going back to zero PSI. So the operator does have a set of eyes when using void pressure monitoring system. The seal is not achieved by the internal grout ring. This is what we see with the CCTV camera. But the seal is actually achieved where the grout mixes with the soil on the outside of the pipe and prevents that groundwater from coming in. That mass, as seen on the right-hand side, is the seal that we want to get. Now, large diameter, they do become man entry at a point. Sometimes I won't. Here is a an example of 36-inch pipe. The left-hand picture shows a pressure gauge where that red arrow is. So that is a way to monitor what is going in on in the void. It is hooked up to a diaphragm in the void. Um, Don was talking about dye earlier. When you get into bigger pipes, it's nice to have the dye in the grout to make sure that you are actually sitting on the joint. So helpful it may be. Mainline sealing capabilities uh, for round pipe, anywhere from 6 inch up to 12 feet in diameter. There's been packers for elliptical pipe that were done, uh, longitudinal cracks in special cases, box culverts, and man entry as seen below. So there's many options that we have for unique problems. Testing and sealing laterals from the main line. 
basically the above ground equipment is pretty much the same, except that we do need to have five hoses because we are running a separate ladder, as indicated in the red circle. There's an effective ceiling distance. Um, in this picture, you can see on the left-hand side the pan and tilt camera. This is how it would be set up. Uh, the green is actually, in this case, is just dyed water to show where it actually seals within the void. So it's going up to the blue line is the, up, the effective ceiling distance from the mainline connection. Uh, in this case, we're talking about 18 to 20 inches. So any defects along that first 20 inches will allow grout to be pumped outside of it. So basically, we're going back. What needs to be done before we do this? Well, once again, make sure of mainline diameter. Cleaning of the mainline sewer. Uh, videotape CCTV inspections. And when grouting long distances in the lateral, and long is subjective, I, I strongly recommend to inspect the laterals. You're going up 20 feet up a lateral with a bladder without inspecting it first. Uh, you may find that you may even have to clean it. So there's tools out there that will allow you to do that either from a clean out or either from the main line access only. Protruding taps, same thing. Roots and grease and other debris that either prevent the passage or the seating of the equipment must be addressed. So basically with the pan and tilt camera, everything is being towed in the line in position at the lateral. First thing, we need to line up the bladder with the lateral, so packers rotated. Bladder is inverted out with air pressure. The last 12 inches of the bladder is what is the part that actually goes up against the pipe to seal off the service. So we have a three-point seal with up in the lateral and on each side of the T or the Y. Lateral connection and predetermined distance up in the lateral. That's important. We see a lot of specifications that says to seal the connection and the lateral, but a predetermined distance would help the cause. Chemical grout is pumped and forced through the existing defect out into the soil. Operator continues to monitor the void sealing pressure during the injection process. And depending on the volumes pumped, uh, operator may use a stage or step grounding process. If you're an eight inch pipe and you're sealing the first foot, two feet of the lateral, and you're at seven gallons and the void pressure has not gone up, I would start thinking about going to a step or stage grounding process. Um, after this procedure, it is Air tested again. If it fails, well, you go to step or stage grounding. If it passes, everything is deflated, vacuum, and moved on to the next section. Don was talking about reline pipes. Lining, greatest stuff in the world. Unfortunately, we have to drill holes in it to give access back to the owners. So water will migrate between the outside of the liner and the inside of the pipe, or even migrate at the first join up the lateral connection, a couple of joints. So wherever water travels, grout being a viscosity that is similar to it, will travel at, through these things. And it's not uncommon that if you have services within a few feet of each other, that you will see the grout come out through the next one that is not actually being sealed. Um, you see here, the objective is to get grout in between the liner and the pipe and through whatever defects are along that way. So through the green to get to the blue and through the red to get access to those cracks. Stage grouting again, um, explain it for main lines, pretty much the same thing for laterals. Pump a certain amount of grout, the void pressure is not going up. Stop, let it set for a while and before the final gel, which we have from the gel time or cup test, pump again and build your layers of grout for your seal. Here's an above ground demonstration. Um, grout's always going to take the path of least resistance. In this case, we have a closed box. Uh, we have an 8-inch main with a 6-inch T and filled with rocks and sand. As you see in the middle picture, yellow, uh, the sand does change color. So basically, we are saturating that soil with the grout. As we keep pumping and pumping, that is moving upwards in this case because it is confined in this box until we achieve a seal. So it is moving through the path of least resistance. Here's an inside view. Um, first one on the left, basically you're looking at the packer, looking at the 10 o'clock position where you have the service connection. There is a residual grout left in the lateral as we are trying to seal an effective sealing distance from the connection. 
so we need to have access to this. Uh, this grout, because it's not sandwiched in between two layers, uh, or it's not in the soil, will eventually, with the pr normal use of the lateral sewer, peel off and get off from the wall. Uh, soil saturation is what we are trying to achieve, adjacent or near the injection points. It is very important to get this. If not, we are not there to seal. We're there for something else. Lateral connection grounding capabilities. Uh, typically, we started off with this with 18, 20 inches. It has gone to uh, 30 feet from the main without any access to the homeowner's end. Typically, we do a lot of six feet up, 10, and up to 15 is most common. Uh, there are so the portion of the laterals that we cannot uh, or do not want to get from the main line. If there are cleanouts, uh, we're talking four inch cleanouts, at least with six inch services or above ground access, there are ways to send flexible packers from that point to finish up from whatever's not been completed back towards the cleanout. There are laterals that are coming into manholes that are effectively sealed with these uh, push flexible pull packers. Uh, they are being done daily and the results are very encouraging. So with this said, John, back to you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very well done. Uh, with that, I think we're gonna do another poll question. So if, uh, if everyone would get to their keyboards and uh, be ready to answer this next poll question. Uh, the question is going to be, what is the most significant source of infiltration? In your opinion, what is the most significant source of infiltration? Is it A, main lines, B, laterals, C, lateral connections, or D, manholes? Please uh, enter your response at this time. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in, so please keep those coming. We'll be tackling those in the Q&A session after Jim's presentation. Uh, we are right on schedule, so uh, we should have plenty of time to hit a lot of those questions here in, uh, in about 15 or 20 minutes when Jim finishes up. I'll just give it another second or so for everyone to go ahead and put their answer in for this uh, infiltration question. I think we're going to get a wide uh, variance of results here. I think there's a big difference of opinion across the country as to what is the most significant source of filtration in our collection systems. With that, I think we'll go ahead and post those results. Looks like uh, most people believe that lateral connections are the largest source of infiltration in our collection systems, and I think we'll uh, tackle that question directly uh, during the Q&A session and, and see well, how the presenters feel about that. With that, I think we'll go ahead and get, uh, get moving on to Jim Shelton's presentation. Jim Shelton is the National Technical, Direct, excuse me, National Technical Director for Buried Infrastructure at Arcadis. He provides technical leadership for all buried infrastructure work conducted for Arcadis U.S. and international water clients. Jim has been program manager for several large sewer rehabilitation programs, including DC Water, Newcastle County, Emerald Coast Utility Authority, Lehigh County, and Fairfax County Stormwater. He has been in the sewer business since 1985. Jim, we take it from there. Thanks, John. Before I get started uh, talking about what the engineer's instructions are, I want to put things in context for everybody, especially for engineers and, and utility authorities that are thinking about putting together their own packages for uh, design and bid of doing this work. And that's really what my portion of the talk is geared toward. A great place to start is the original ASTM standards. Uh, reading them and understanding their import will go a long way toward improving your understanding of how to grout properly for both uh, highly effective and long-lasting results. In addition to that, in 2012 and then most recently um, redone in January 2014, NASCO and ICGA released a uh, master specification or a guidance specification that built on the ASTM. It's a little bit more geared toward um, defining how to actually go about doing the work. It's a lot of those 
a lot of the pieces of this specification are geared toward the contractors actually doing the work, but it makes an excellent guidance source for understanding how to specify and inspect uh, gr successful grouting projects. Okay, so let's let's get into this. The, the, the big question that's always on everybody's mind, and I get asked this by every utility that ever considers grouting, is really how, how effective is this? We've heard lots of stories about grouting not working. We hear lots of salesmen telling us the grouting lasts for forever. What, you know, how, how does this grout work? How, how well does it last? Well, the, the bottom line is, is that the grout itself is a chemical. It's going to last for forever. But really, it's not its chemical properties that you're concerned with. It's its ability to stop leakage that really drives what's going on. And the single biggest impact of that really has, has something to do with the grout, but it's far more related to the quality of the installation. And, that, and that's really related to what are your specifications? What is it you're asking the contractor to do? How are you asking him to, to do that work? And, and what level of oversight you're providing? If you don't do both of those things properly, you're never going to get a long-lasting job. It's just the nature of the animal. Uh, in terms of how much, how effective is grout from an I and I reduction standpoint, it really comes down to how much of the system is sealed. It's no different than any other rehabilitation. The more holistic your rehabilitation process is, the greater your, your flow reductions are going to be. You heard Don talk about the, the four different points of, of leakage. Addressing all of those is really what's key. We've been doing grouting at Arcadis for about 15 years now, and we've been lucky enough to be able to do uh, different types of pre- and post-monitoring. The one that we favor the most is a control basin methodology. Uh, and we've looked at a number of different rehabilitation projects that feature grouting. Um, from that, we see a variety of ranges of performance, anywhere from as low as 20% to we've had two projects where they were almost at 100%. And those, again, are directly related to how much of the mainline manholes and laterals and tap connections are actually done, as well as some uh, site-specific things like the, the types of soils and the initial leaking characteristics. A system that's built in sand or that's got um, 57 stone as its backfill material is going to leak a lot to begin with. So you're going to tend to get higher reductions out of those types of soils than you will out of pipes that are bedded in uh, more clay type of soils. The other question I get asked all the time is, how long does this last? And to be frank with you, there's not a lot of studies. The, the one study I know of is the one that I did. We, we did a study on pipe that was grouted in 2004, 5, and 6, uh, three different contractors, three different project areas. We went back seven years later and tested uh, almost f over 400 of the main line joints. Those are the eight-inch joints. This is all clay pipe and three, four, and five-foot clay joints. And what we found when we did that was we had a 95% pass rate at seven years. To be honest with you, that's beyond what we thought it was going to be. We had been promoting a life cycle for grout of about 15 years uh, up until that point. But when we started to see these results, we've since pushed that out to say it's going to last at least 25 years. Some people would say to me, why not more than 25 years? Well, I simply don't have enough data points to, to reliably say that it possibly could. But at this point in time, I, uh, you know, we're, we're recommending that our clients consider their capital program based on the 25 year. The interesting thing about these mainline joints is that 3% of the joints that we went back and looked at that failed, uh, we grouted them afterwards as well. And Almost every single one, 12 out of those 13 joints, took over five additional gallons. Now, they'd already taken quite a bit of grout to begin with. So in each of those locations, you've got some sort of extenuating void circumstance going on behind the pipe, potentially some other cabling work and things like that. Those are the types of things that are going to affect any rehabilitation technology. The 2% which were new failures uh, also took an awful lot of grout, so our, our um, estimate is, is that those probably were based on joints that weren't properly tested the first time around. Either way, a pretty good pass rate. Um, the lateral tap connections are often uh, the point of greatest concern. They're difficult to do sometimes, uh, but what we found was that of the 31 that we went back and looked at, it was almost a 50-50 split between what was done originally and then nine years later, what we looked at in terms of what had passed and what had failed was that all of those passed. So properly done, 
you're going to get high leakage removal rates, and you're going to get a long-lasting seal. And again, if you go back and start with those, those master specifications, you're well on your way to developing a decent set of specs for this. The rest of my presentation is really focused on how to take those two documents and tweak them to get even higher performance. Don talked about this decade being our focus on, on quality and you know, on you know, really uh, making, grouting a more robustly applied technology. This is really what we're getting into. The bottom line is for grout to work, it's got to be properly installed. You heard both Don and Mark talk about needing to get the grout out into the ground. That's exactly right. Any grout that you're seeing inside the pipe is wasted grout. It only does you good if it's outside. Bottom line is on an 8-inch joint, if you want a long-term seal, you need to get two to four gallons of grout out into that joint. I can tell you I spent probably the first 10, maybe 12 years of my career thinking that a tenth of a gallon of grout was going to seal a joint. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about veneering, but it, it really doesn't. Your, your focus should be a minimum of two and with a sweet spot of, of closer to three gallons. To do that, the grout has to get out into the soil while it's still liquid. That means that the gel time, the period of time from where it comes out of that packer that Mark showed you where it was spraying out, mixes with the A part and the B part, starts to catalyze and then hardens, needs to be long enough so that water-like product, that you know, water-like viscosity, can work out, push it in the soil voids outside the pipe, and then start to seal up so that it's a fully integrated mixture of soil fines, uh, pipe bedding material, and the gel. And all the tools in order to do that have to work properly to do that. So I, I want to talk a minute about this concept of veneering versus long-term sealing. And veneering is what I did, like I said, for the first 12 years of my career. Uh, bottom line is on an 8-inch joint, you can get a seal. A contractor will seal that with four-tenths of a gallon of grout. Every joint that leaks, it'll, pass, it'll fail the air test, and he'll pump four gallons of grout, and it will pass. But if you start thinking about the mass, the void space in a packer is typically about three-tenths of a gallon. Uh, there's typically a little space on the inside of the pipe where the joint is seen. They get another tenth of a gallon in there, and you've sealed it. You've effectively put a skin coat over that joint, and it will pass the air test, but you've got zero gallons outside the pipe. That type of grouting is a waste of time. You're never going to get a long-term seal. And it wouldn't surprise me if within a rain or two, you know, as soon as you get enough hydrostatic head building behind it, that those types of grouting situations immediately start to fail. And certainly that's what I was doing back in the 80s, I, I, I know for a fact. Um, in order to, to get a long-term seal, you've got to pump lots of grout outside. The rule of thumb is to get a quart per inch diameter. And that's two gallons of grout for every eight-inch joint. Uh, and that's the minimum. Now, that can vary a little bit if you're in really tight soils, but if you're in a normally bedded pipe that's in sand, any kind of pea gravel, Ashto 57, you'll have absolutely no trouble getting two gallons of grout out into the soil. When you're doing uh, lateral tap connections, if you're doing an eight-foot lateral uh, packer, that's the sock that comes out, uh, it really depends on the tap diameter, how long you're doing how many joints you're encountering in that. But a rough rule of thumb is you want to shoot for about three quarters of a gallon of grout for each foot of lateral packer. This takes into account the losses in the, in the uh, void space as well as getting out into the pipe, what you need to get out there. Bottom line is the rule of thumb should be more is better. Right up to a certain point, if you're in these soils, if you're in these bedding materials that can really take a lot of grout, you don't want to throw grout away needlessly filling all the interstitial space of the stone with grout. Uh, once you're pumping consistently about 150% of your goal, so that's in the neighborhood of three gallons of grout per joint for an 8-inch pipe, you really want to switch over to that step grouting or stage grouting that Mark was talking about that allows the grout to set up and, and allows you to achieve a long-term reliable effective seal without wasting a lot of grout. Grout is uh, its not expensive, but it's also not free, so you don't want to just throw it away. As I said, a big part of this is getting the gel out into the soil, so you want to set a long gel time. This, this is to ensure that you get it out into the soil as a complete liquid matrix to let it really permeate and get through. The two formulas that you're seeing on screen are the two formulas that 
Arcadis is currently using for uh, establishing gel time. The top one is for a mainline pack, and you can see it's got uh, accommodation for the annular space. It's got an accommodation for that quart of grout per foot. It also recognizes that gel time is a function of pumping rate. Every single truck pumps at a different rate. So you've got to be able to establish what that pump rate is. A, a truck that puts out eight gallons a minute will have a much lower gel time than a pump that puts out two gallons a minute. The lower formula is the formula that we use for uh, pumping laterals or grabbing laterals from the main line as well. Um, it's, these uh, formulas also have a 20% safety factor on the end. That's to recognize the fact that when you're doing your pumping tests, uh, you're not doing that with the packer in place. You're doing it at the end of the hose. So you've got some additional friction losses. And we find 20% pretty much puts us right where we need to go. Um, setting the long gel time also lets us pump at a lower rate. That allows us to get the gel in a more even distribution around the defect uh, and helps to minimize the, the piping that you can sometimes see. The picture that you see popped up is actually grout that's come up all the way through in a, in a void space and actually pushed the pavement up on a, in a parking lot where we were grouting. The, lower gel, the higher gel time helps to reduce that. This table gives you an idea of what those are. Anybody that's done grouting before, uh, if you were doing a typical pumping rate of four gallons a minute on an eight inch pipe, most contractors are out there setting their gel time at a cup test of 20 seconds, which means an effective gel time that's in the neighborhood of 10 or 15 seconds uh, once, it, once it warms up. And that's uh, anywhere from half to a quarter of where you really want it to be in order to be able to get the grout out into the soil in the type of condition you want it to be in before it sets. So gel time becomes a really key control uh, aspect or variable of, of successful grouting. and something that the engineer needs to clearly specify in the specifications. This is not something you want to leave up to the contractor to decide. Longer gel time equals more money in order to do this. The contractor is going to be on the joint longer, and his inclination is going to be to do it faster. So you need to make sure you've clearly set what that's going to be. So once you've got that, how do you, how do you get the types of results I'm talking about? Well, it's, it's directly related to these four things. And I, I want to talk about each of these things in their turn. First, your specification ingredients. We, we've already talked about gel time and pumping rates. I want to talk for a minute about the type of grout that we use. The standard grout formulation is a 10% acrylamide mixture. Um, and that 10% acrylamide mixture is very commonly used. It provides a decent amount of strength. But if you go back 20 years, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that, the standard mix was a 12% mix. It really got changed because of OSHA requirements on limiting how big the bag could be when you pick it up. We still prefer a 12% mix. It's got an increased strength. Where you do have a lot of groundwater movement, it, even though grout isn't really highly prone to dilution, especially with the additives I'm going to talk about in a minute, it does make it more resistant to, to groundwater migration. And, and it gives a, a nice strong mix. It, it's, it, when you mix it, it does increase the cost a little bit, but not enough to really drive the entire cost of the job. You heard Don talk about latex. He's a fan of latex. I think it's important. Uh, for almost every aspect of what we're doing. Uh, latex really improves what, what I think of as the tackiness. Acrylamide itself is kind of like a wet fish. But when you, when you mix the latex in it, it gives it a stickiness. And it's all about getting a seal on the outside of that pipe. So you want something that's got a little grab, a little tackiness. It does increase the strength, uh, which is nice. But really, more importantly than even that, it really improves grout's resistance to desiccation. Many, many people will ask me about, Jim, isn't this stuff going to dry out? There are certain places where uh, grout will dry out, certainly not appropriate acrylamide grout anyway, in, in really shallow applications where the ground's going to get bone dry. But in most places, you're, you're going to have more than enough moisture in the soil and coming out from the sewer to keep it uh, fully hydrated. But to overcome any resistance to desiccation that we might be getting near the pipe, we add it um, typically in a 3% mixture rate. If we're doing defect routing where we've got some pretty broad spans that we've got to go across, 
we'll double that. And if we're doing anything shallow, we'll, we'll double it as well and go to a 6% latex mix. It is expensive. It does add some cost to the job. Uh, and contractors typically don't like dealing with it because it tends to make the tank set up a little quicker. Uh, it just makes it a little bit harder to clean. You've got to make sure you've got good housekeeping from the contracting side to make that work. And then the other mixture that uh, becomes important is glycol. Uh, a lot of people use it strictly for wintertime work. I like it in dry soils. I think it's also a water displacer in the grout. The grout we're putting in is primarily water. The glycol is a displacer, and as we get shallower and shallower, I, I put more and more glycol in it in order to uh, help to ensure that the grout's uh, ability to desiccate gets less and less. It is a very big cost adder to the job, so you want to be judicious in its use. The last piece in the specs I want to talk about comes back to gel time. A lot of engineers and owners don't really recognize that the catalyzing time, the, the amount of time it takes for the gel to set is highly temperature dependent. For every 10 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature increase that you get, you get a halving of the gel time. So on a, on a day like today where it started out at 55 degrees when I got up this morning, if I'd made up my batch mix at 40 seconds, right now it's 85 degrees outside, uh, that gel time is just five seconds. I'm not going to seal anything with a gel time of five seconds. So I've got to monitor that. You want to make sure in your specifications you're having your contractor monitor the temperature of the grout. If you're pumping as much grout as you should be, it shouldn't be an issue because he's making up two or three or four batches a day. But we still have in our specifications to so the contractor check and adjust his gel time for every five degrees change in either ambient temperature or tank temperature that happens while he's working. OK, so those are the specification grades. So let's talk a little bit about A basis. Uh, engineers uh, oftentimes don't put enough time into thinking through how they're incentivizing or disincentivizing the contractors that are going to eventually do their work. This is especially true in a low bid, design bid build type of environment. Uh, what I recommend is that you look at the aspects of the work that contractors are likely to cut corners on, and you adjust your pay basis or you adjust your specifications to do that. I spent a, a, a good number of years, probably eight or 10 years, thinking that grout only cost a penny a gallon, because that was the only price I ever got, and that actually pumping grout was less than a dollar to pump the grout at each joint. It was $22 to test it, but only a dollar to to pump it. And of course, that's because the contractors want to put all their money into what they know they're going to get paid. They're going to get paid to test the joints, not necessarily to grout it if, it's, if it doesn't fail. Uh, if you set a price for grout, a minimum price for grout, you take away the disincentive for them to not pump grout. It's, it's the single biggest non-labor cost. And uh, you want to make sure that they're on the same page you are with regard to pumping as much grout as you need. We also set a minimum price for grouting so the contractor is not inclined to want to fake a pass on a joint in order to move the job along. This way, at least he's getting compensated in some fashion for that aspect of the work. And then the inspection practices on the back side. You can specify the job perfectly. But if there's not somebody there making sure the job gets done properly, I can tell you from experience it's not going to get done properly. Grouting is too easy of a, of a practice to uh, cut corners on and to not do it properly. And I, th and I think some of, the, some of the issues that we've seen over the years with grouting not necessarily uh, lasting as long are related to this. It all starts in the morning with your pre-grouting tests. Uh, these are packer pressure tests, pumping rate tests, and your initial gel time tests. In addition to that, throughout the day, you want to do checks on your grout. We've talked about the, the gel time. A lot of folks don't recognize that when you mix acrylamide, you've got an endothermic reaction that takes place initially when it goes in with the water. You actually get a temperature drop of about 15 degrees Fahrenheit in the A tank. That will strongly change your gel time, especially as that tank warms up to ambient. We also want to ensure that they're following specifications for mixing the tanks. The, the solids do tend to settle out, so you want to turn those tanks over every 30 to 60 minutes, as, as well as checking your pump rates to make sure you're pumping on an equal basis throughout the day. In order to make sure that we don't have to have a con uh, an inspector sitting with every single truck, 
every single minute. We employ a pullback test where the contractor calls our inspector and uh, when he's done a line, and then we'll at random pick 5% of the joints. Uh, typically, this rolls out to two that were grouted and two that weren't grouted to make sure that they pass. When a contractor knows you're going to do that, he's usually going to pay attention to what he's doing. He doesn't want to have to go through and redo the entire line. And in our experience, uh, the pullback test under those circumstances passes better than 98% of the time. To make sure the contractor is vested in getting a long-term product as we are, we also use warranty testing. It's a contractual requirement that has the contractor come back and retest 15% of the joints and tap connections two years after he's installed them. If he's got on his books that he's got to come back and do this, and if they don't hold, he's got to do another 15%. And if those don't hold, he's got to do the whole job over again. Again, it's investing him in the same level of, of uh, quality installation that, that we've got. There's one other aspect to inspection that comes into play, and that has to do with defects. You know, grouting is not a structural repair. There's lots of types of defects, uh, breaks and partial collapses that grouting can't do anything for you on. Uh, we've recently developed some techniques that allow us to do some longitudinal and multiple fractures. And certainly, circumferential fractures are, are easily addressed. In clay pipe, you're, you always have a concern that as you stop water and as you're introducing grout that you might be damaging the pipe. The beautiful thing about grouting is you're going to get, over the course of a two or three week period, multiple looks at a pipe. So you've got a real ability to look at defects and establish whether they're a stable defect. In other words, they've been there for a long time and they're not going anywhere. Or are they unstable and really require some, some method of uh, structural repair, whether it's a cured in place line or an excavated point repair? In our experience, we find that the vast majority, and this is greater than 95% of the defects, are stable. And while it seems like this is an awful lot of inspections to have to go through, there are, there are so many post-inspection tools that are available right now to make this process fairly easy from a construction administration standpoint. So I highly recommend you do that. So for all this to work, you've got to follow that holistic grouting practice. It really starts with testing the mainline joints, in any circumferential defect, anything that looks like a joint, even if it's just a broken pipe, but it's still circumferential, you can grout that. You want to grout the lateral tap connections. You want to grout all of the laterals that come from the manholes. Typically, we take that back 30 feet or to the property line, whichever is more. You want to test and seal any leaks coming from the manholes. More and more, our uh, practice is starting to grout the fractures as well. It is test and sealing the laterals from the cleanouts. Uh, we, we just completed a project in the Carolinas where we found that uh, the failure rates that we saw were highest in the lateral joints, uh, probably by a factor of about 30% more than the mainline joints. Are. So there's an awful lot of leakage that's going to come up through there. So having to go after that becomes an important aspect of what you're doing. Anything that, uh, not everything can be grouted. So it's important that you have uh, in your toolbox here the ability to put in cured in place Point repairs, and if you come across lines that have typically more than one broken pipe, not fractured pipe, but broken pipe, those are typically good candidates for cured in place pipe lining. They'll still benefit from grouting, and in most cases, they would have required some measure of grouting in order to facilitate the lining anyway. But you should recognize that, that uh, grouting is not a silver bullet, that there, there are going to be the need for other technologies in order to complete that holistic sealing practice. With that, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Very, very well done. Thank you, Jim. Uh, just a quick note, much of the items that, uh, that Jim covered in his presentation are, are included in the specification that's located at uh, the ICGA website, sewergrouting.com. Also, uh, we've got a lot of questions, and we're never going to be able to cover all of them in this short period of time. So we're going to uh, be sending out answers to the questions to all the audience participants. So if for some reason you didn't get uh, an answer to your question in, at this moment in the Q&A session, you can see an email from, uh, from the group here in the next few weeks uh, with answers to the, your questions so we can uh, make sure that we get each one answered appropriately. We're going to do a quick poll question to finish up the presentation at this moment. Uh, and that poll question will simply be, uh, what matters most? Uh, grout mix and additives, pumping rate and gel times, 
volume of effective grout placed and injection pressures. Experienced contractor and inspector are all of the above. Let's go ahead and uh, tab in your answer to those questions at this time. Uh, we were going to just move right on to the Q&A session here since we have a limited amount of time. And I'd like all the presenters to go ahead and uh, unmute themselves and key in so we can uh, tackle these as a group. I'm going to direct them to individuals so we can uh, try and keep this quick and to the point. We'll start out with uh, Mark Engtel. Uh One of the questions was, uh, what is a reasonable distance to specify to grout in a lateral connection to the main line? Want to tackle that one, Mark? Sure. Uh, that's all going to depend on your objectives. Uh, absolutely, you could go 30 feet up, but that will cost you more money because you will first have to inspect the lateral on the length to be sealed, and you'll probably have to clean it. So this is added uh, cost to the owner of the system. Uh, typically, what is being done without, I'll call it lateral inspection, is basically just about six and sometimes 10 feet up the lateral. Um, it's very difficult to tell you right off the bat, but it's going to be project specific on what you're trying to achieve and basically the budget along with it. Um, that's my short answer. Good points. Very good points. Uh, with that, I've got one for Don. It, uh, what is the life expectancy can be expected for the various grout types, uh, acrylamide and uh, urethanes? Well, our friends at the DOE did a study, 20-year study, and this was back in, um, started in 1985. They were looking at how to contain a hazardous waste in, uh, in the state of Tennessee. And they evaluated seven different grout types, and they looked at AV100 or the acrylamide as, uh, and evaluated that as a 362-year half-life, as long as it stays in the soil. You take that grout, you put it in a cup, and you stick it in a parking lot, it'll shrink, shrivel, add water, it'll come back, rebound. But from in the soil standpoint, it will, it has that kind of a life expectancy. Now, can you make that leap from hazardous waste containment to, to a sewer trench? Some people can't make that leap, and that's why we're doing scientific studies on that right now, and I should have some news on that by uh, end of year. Outstanding. Your question. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that. Uh, this one's for Jim. Uh, do you have any recommendations for what to do in high groundwater areas? I guess, I guess the question is, is, is uh, grouting appropriate for high groundwater areas? I think it's perfect for high groundwater areas. I would, <laughs> I would caution you not to use grouting if your pipes aren't leaking. You know, it's, it's meant to be a leakage controller. I, I think maybe the question's more geared toward what happens when you've got groundwater that's so high that it, you've got runners and gushers coming into the pipe from multiple locations. That's um, another one of the questions. Why don't you tackle that while you're yeah. at it? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 gel, the gel times that I talked about are in your normal, typical situations. If you find yourself in a situation where you've got, you know, three foot or five foot joints and you're pumping grout out at, at a 40 second or a 90 second gel time and it's just running right back in, you've got too high of a groundwater velocity, really it's a pipe bedding velocity, and you must lower your grout uh, gel time at that point. The nice thing is it's super easy to do. A couple of tablespoons of tea, uh, the, the catalyst, and you've got, you've got a low gel time. It's really easy. Um, don't don't let anybody kid you. It's it's really easy to to dial up or dial down grout. It takes a couple minutes to do, and, and it's done. Uh, and so you you've got to be aware of what's going on and uh, be flexible enough in what you're trying to achieve uh, and what and how you achieve what your goals are for the project. So the short answer to your question is. Grouting in high groundwater conditions is the absolute perfect place to put it in. The grout will never desiccate. There's no issues of drying at all. You don't have to rely on any humidity to keep the grout uh, fully swelled, fully, uh, fully formed, because you've got water around it all the time. The most successful places at doing grouting are along the beach. Very well. Good. Thank you, Jim. Uh, another question had to do with odor. Has, is there a chemical odor to the grout, and will that migrate through faulty traps into homes? Has that ever been an issue in grouting laterals? And uh, I'll tackle that one uh, 
The answer is no. The grout is a, is a very low odor level. Uh, it's not so similar to a to a lining type process. Typically, you you can barely sense the odor of the grout after it's been uh, been gelled. So that would not be a concern at all for for anybody that's doing grouting work in the laterals, especially uh, house laterals. Along with that, I've got another question for Mark. Uh, he kind of started to tackle that one. Uh, is it possible to clean a lateral with mainline access only? Uh, you said something about that when you were just talking a few minutes ago. Yes, there are tools out there that, uh, with the help of CCT camera, camera and jetters, uh, three eighths or half inch shows, that are able to launch the basically the nozzle up in the lateral and uh, clean uh, residual or excess grout if that's the case, or even clean and cut roots and get some rid of rid of those debris. And to my knowledge, so far the longest run that's been done was up about 70 feet up a lateral from the mainline sewer. Typically, you're going 20, 25 feet, but it's being done on a daily basis. Very good. Uh, and then this one back to Jim. Uh, will a grouted sewer line pass a pressure test? Uh, yes and no. Um, depends on what the pressure is. Uh, on, a, on a normal specified job, what you're trying to do is overcome how, the maximum amount of groundwater pressure that might be on the joint. So typically, we use a rule of thumb that says whatever your feet below grade is, you divide that by 2 and then add 2. So if you're 10 feet below grade, that's 5 PSI plus 2. So you'll test it at 7 PSI and you'll want it to pass that. Once you've got it to pass 7, if you dial up your, your air pressure and you test it at 12, you're going to blow it out. Um, so yes, it will pass a, an air test, uh, but if you overpressurize it, it will fail it as well. Very good. Uh, and one more quick question for Don. Uh, let me grab it here. Uh, does the set time affect the lifespan of the grout? The set time, it does not. What matters, and gel time matters, temperature matters, gel mix matters. Gel time matters most when it, it has to go out and combine with the soil and build that matrix. Now, if we have a, a longer set time, does that, does that impede the life expectancy? Absolutely not. When that gel time occurs, that product is is not going to change properties over its lifetime? So the answer is no. Very good. Uh, with that, I think we're going to have to move on to uh, Ted DeBoto, who will do a closing uh, session here for everyone. Uh, really appreciate everyone's participation and, uh, and attendance in the, in the webinar today. Ted? Yeah, I'll, I want to thank the presenters. Uh, all of you guys did a great job, very thorough, for, um, and thank you for bringing your time and your expertise um, in chemical grouting. Uh, like John mentioned, you know, we really appreciate all of your questions uh, on chemical grouting. Um, we're going to uh, provide all of your questions to today's presenters, the panel, and we'll follow up with an email within the next few weeks with a link to all of the answers that will be on both the NASCO.org and the sewergrouting.com websites. Now, we'll also be sending you a link within the next 24 hours uh, to show you how to get the, the recording of this, of this webinar as well as some of the resources that we've discussed. Now, speaking of the resources, um, ICGA and NASCO, we work together to provide the industry, including all of you, with the resources to ensure the success of all trenches technologies, including chemical grouting. Uh, so you'll find a lot of these on the uh, um, on our websites, on the um, to include specifications, training schedules, uh, technical support, and uh, membership directory. And the sewergrouting.org uh, website, uh, you'll find the specifications that we discussed today, plus technical support, uh, a membership directory, and also. Uh, probably most important, some training opportunities that are provided by the ICGA members, but members of the ICGA. And just as an example, one that's coming up is what's called a grout boot camp. Uh, this is being offered October 21st and 22nd in Lithia Springs, Georgia. 
Uh, this class, which is a great class, involves hands-on demonstrations of equipment performance and grout testing for uh, requirements, and it helps for compliance with the NASCO and ICGA grout specifications, like those that were discussed today. Um, and finally, I want to thank you all for participating. We hope to see you all at WEFTEC in Chicago. Uh, as always, we'll be with the Sewer History Exhibit, and we hope to see you there. Thanks. Have a, have a good day. Bye-bye.